Welcome to this week's episode of Reading the Gospels Through Hebrew Eyes. John chapter 16, verses 23 through 33 are going to be our focus in this video. It's a reading that continues from last Sunday and will be the reading for this coming Sunday. And in it, Jesus talks about praying in his name. So we want to talk about what exactly that means. It's pretty common for Christians in their prayers in Jesus' name. Well, what does that exactly mean? How is name connected to essence? We'll get to that via some Old Testament text. Also, there's an allusion to the book of Zechariah about a shepherd being struck and sheep being scattered that Jesus alludes to in these words. And also, at the same time, there's a reference back to kind of a strange situation in 1 Kings 22 involving King Ahab. So we want to take a look at that as well. And along the way, we'll reference other Old Testament texts that are going to help us to better understand this very end of Jesus' farewell discourse with his disciples. This brings us to the end of John chapter 16. John chapter 17, of course, is Jesus' high priestly prayer. So let's jump into John chapter 16 with verse 23 and see what our Lord says to his disciples. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. First thing I want to point out is this very common phrase in the Gospel of John. In fact, it occurs 25 times. Amen, amen, lego. Truly, truly, I say. And sometimes it's to you in the plural, to y'all, we might say. Sometimes it's to you in the singular. But a very common phrase in the Gospel of John, used, of course, to, to accentuate something, to underscore, to underline whatever Jesus is saying here. So, amen, amen, truly, you truly, or amen, amen, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. So, as I mentioned in the introduction to this video, very, very often Christians will pray for something, give thanks for something, and end it in Jesus' name. It kind of, it kind of can become sort of a rote formula. So, let's just stop and think about it for a minute. What exactly does it mean to pray in the name of of Jesus? Well, I think the best answer to that question is to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 and to ask what is the importance and significance of names in the creation narrative. So on your screen, if you're looking at that, I've got the first uh, about 10 verses from Genesis chapter 1. And highlighted in yellow, I've got references to how God will, first of all, create something and then he will call it something. So Verse 3, God said, let there be light. There was light. God saw the light was good. God separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. In Hebrew, that is kara, to call or to name something. Skip on down to the next section, verses 6 through 8, same thing. God then called the expanse heaven. And then down to verse 10, God called, named, we might say, the dry land earth. And the waters that he gathered together, he called Seas. Now, what's happening here in Genesis 1, and you could perpetuate this to the rest of the creation account, is that God creates and then God names. He makes something, He names something. So, we might say that the naming of something completes, as it were, the creation process. It's the, it's the crowning moment of the creation process. Not enough just to be made, but whatever is made is to be named. And what that means is that in the Bible, Names are not just a handy way of being able to identify something. They are enmeshed with being itself. So a name is not an empty word or label, but is virtually identical with that which is named. So with that understanding, when we pray in Jesus' name, what are we really doing? We are praying with an understanding that using his name, Jesus in this case, Using his name is the equivalent of using him. That is to say, we're not just referring to the five letters of his name, as it were. We are referring to the totality of who he is and entail with that the totality of everything that he's accomplished for us. So in Jesus' name equals in the totality of who he is and what he has accomplished for us. That's what it means to pray in his name. So another way of saying in Jesus' name is basically in Christ or in Jesus, in everything that 
Matthew 1 through the end of John's gospel tells us everything that comprises who Jesus is, what he's accomplished for us, that is bound up in the name of Jesus. Because the name, again, is not just a label, certainly not a magical formula. That's anti-Christian. The name is the representation, the embodiment of everything that Christ has accomplished for us. So when we pray in Jesus' name, we are praying with the understanding that we are asking the Father on the basis of everything that Christ has accomplished for us. So that's what it means to pray in Jesus' name, and that name theology is understood from Genesis 1 and 2. So that's the opening, 23 and 24. Let's see what happens in verse 25. Jesus goes on to say, I have said these, these things to you in figures of speech, paroimia in the Greek. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in paroimia, in figures of speech, but I will tell you paresia, plainly about the Father. So we have two different words here, paroimia and paresia. So this, this translation, which is from the ESV, is... Uh, echoed and modified by various other translations. I've got them on your screen there, everything from the NIV to the New American Standard to the King James Version. So in all these various translations, it's translated as I am, have been speaking to you figuratively or through figures of speech or through allegories or through proverbs or in figurative language or in veiled language. They're all attempting to catch, to bring forth the understanding of por, par oimia. The Hebrew behind it, by the way, would be mashal. Mashal is sometimes translated as proverb, but it's it, it's more it's kind of a more generic term for all sorts of wisdom sayings, uh, parables, things things of that nature. The same word is used also in John chapter ten, verse six. It's used three times in John's gospel. In John ten six, we read this figure of speech, this paroimia, Jesus used with them, but they didn't understand what he was saying to them. There it's talking about the parable of Jesus being the door or the gate for the sheep. They didn't understand this figurative speech that, that Jesus was using. So what's happening is that Jesus is telling his disciples, I've spoken to you figuratively. I've used parables. I've used proverbial sayings. I've used fi figurative language. But I'm not going to do that anymore. We're transitioning now to a time, and that time is my, my upcoming post-resurrection period when you, with you when I will speak plainly. I will no longer speak in these proverbial dark sayings. Instead, I'm going to speak openly and plainly to you. Okay, now let's see what happens in the verses that following, 26 through 28. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. One note on those two verbs, you have loved me and you have believed that I come, came from God. In Greek, that's the perfect tense. You could kind of understand it in this way. I have, I have entered into a state, you have entered into a state of loving me. You have entered into a state of believing in me. In other words, it's not just simply a point in the past, but it's a, it's a faith and it's a, and it's a love that began and still continue into the presence. That's, that's kind of the, the implication of the perfect tense there. So when Jesus says that the Father loves you because you love me and believed in me, don't, don't, mis mis don't misunderstand that as if God was around waiting for these people to finally believe in and love his son before he began to love them. No, over and over in John's gospel, the evangelist makes it clear that God's love toward us in the gift of his son preceded any kind of love that we might have for God. For God so loved the world, or God loved the world in this way, that he gave his only begotten son. So his love, the fatherly divine love, preceded any kind of love or faith on our part. This is simply Jesus' way of saying that the father has, has chosen you, has loved you, has has shown favor to you, and he is doing that because you have believed and you have loved his son. Why do you believe and love his son? Because he loved you and gave that son to you. Therefore, your love and your faith are a result of God's prior action to you. Now, there's one statement here, there's one verse here that beautifully summarizes 
the whole ministry of Jesus, and at the same time, interestingly, alludes back to Isaiah chapter 55. It's this verse. Jesus says, I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. So notice how this this sums up the entire ministry of Jesus. I came from the Father. Well, what does that imply? Well, it implies his divine origin. He was with the Father in heaven. He came down. That's his incarnation. He becomes one of us. He's come into the world. He became one of us. And what did he do? He's exercised his ministry among us. But now he's leaving the world. He's going to be lifted up in his crucifixion. This is his death and his resurrection. He's leaving the world because he's going to die. He's going to rise again. And then what will he do? He will go to the Father. That's his ascension and his reign. So in those four words, in this one verse, we have summarized the ministry of Jesus on our behalf. He comes from the Father. He came into the world. He's leaving the world. He's going to the Father. Now, also, this language of coming down from above and then doing the work that God had sent and the returning back to God, that is captured in one of Isaiah's images for what the Word of God does. Well, of course, what does Jesus call, what does John call Jesus? The Logos, the Word of God. So look at these well-known verses from Isaiah 55, 10 and 11. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven... And do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So just like rain and snow do that, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So his word will come back. It just won't come back empty. It's going to accomplish that for which it was sent. And fascinating here. So accomplish, it shall accomplish. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation, that verb is teleo. Teleo was the same root of tetelestai. When Jesus cries out from the cross, it has been finished or it is finished. We could also translate that it has been accomplished. So the word came down from heaven. The word did the work that the father sent to do. And then it teleoed, it accomplished it. To Telestai, it has been accomplished, and then it returned to the Father, not empty, but having done that for which the Father sent it. So that's the verses leading up to this. Now we're going to move into 29 through 31, and we'll see how the disciples react to this. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? So we'll talk about exactly what that question means in in just a second. First of all, this language of not needing anyone to question you. What what does that entail? Well, one, one resource that I go to constantly, every time that I do these videos, anytime that I'm looking at the Gospels, I always refer to the commentary on the New Testament use of the Old Testament. And there's a quote here that I think was helpful for explaining what is implied by that phrase, not needing anyone to question you. Jesus is not needing anyone to ask him questions should be understood in light of the Jewish notion that the ability to anticipate questions is a mark of divinity. So implicit here is that Jesus himself coming from the Father is divine as the Father is. So the disciples say what they have to say. Oh, now that now you're talking plainly. No, you're no longer using these, this parabolic speech. And Jesus says, oh, well, do you believe now? I think what's happening here is that the disciples are overestimating their understanding of what Jesus is saying. So there is truth in what they reply to him, but as often happens in the Gospels, people say more than they understand. So they say something which on the surface is true, and yet at the same time, they really don't plumb the depths of that which they themselves have uttered. It's, it's, it's the same here. And you can see this by Jesus' ironic question. Oh, do you believe now? Now are you already getting it? When he had already told them, listen, you're not really going to get it until after my death and resurrection. So Jesus begins with that question. Let's see what happens in the, di- in the, in the speech that follows. So to pick up with Jesus' question, he answered them, do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come. When you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. 
Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So let's talk about this I image of being scattered. First of all, the Greek there is skorpizo, and it is reflective here. I think what's happening here is this is, this is an allusion back to Zechariah 13, 7, where we read, and the, the entire context here is important, but verse 7 is this, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and what will happen to the sheep? The sheep will be scattered. Now, if you look in Mark 14, 27 and Matthew 16, 31, that particular verse from Zechariah 13 is quoted there. So this is John's version of that quotation. So Matthew 14, Mark 14, Matthew 16, and, Ze and here in John 16, they all are referring back to Zechariah 13. The shepherd who's about to be struck, of course, is Christ himself. And when that happens, when he is arrested, when he is struck by the religious leadership, and then when he's struck in his crucifixion, what happened to his sheep? They are scattered. And we see that, of course, especially on the night when he is arrested, when his disciples flee from the guards who have taken Jesus. At the same time, there is a reference back to, an, an echo back to 1 Kings 22. This is where the prophet Micaiah said to King Ahab, and if you know anything about King Ahab, you know that he was, he was not a good guy. He was, a, he was a, the husband of Jezebel, uh, a, a rampant idolater and spread of idolatry in the, in the northern kingdom. So the prophet Micaiah said to Ahab, who was about to go out to battle, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each return to his home in peace. Now, if you look, if you compare 1 Kings 22 with what Jesus is saying, John 16, you see that also we have Jesus making use of this language. So we have, of course, the language of scattering of, of, of sheep. And then also in 1 Kings 22, we read, let each to return to his own home. And then in John 16, each to his own could be home in Greek. The, uh, the home part there is left off. It's kind of assumed that you know what, what, what is being referred to. So here in 1 Kings 22, Ahab, the kingly shepherd of the, northern, of the northern kingdom, is going to be struck down. And what will happen to his citizens, his shepherds, his sheep, they'll be scattered. But we have, let each return to his home in peace. Now what's happening in John chapter 16 is that Christ is going to be struck, that kingly shepherd, and his people will be scattered as well, each to his own home. But at the same time, there's a contrast set up here, because if you know about the life of Ahab, that leader, that king in Israel, what happens at his death, at the death of that shepherd, is that yes, the sheep are scattered, but they still remain without a shepherd. What happens in the case of Jesus who is the contrast to King Ahab, is when he, the regal shepherd, is struck down in arrest and crucifixion. His sheep are scattered as well, but the father remains with him and he will regather his flock after his resurrection. So there's sort of a typology going on here between Ahab and Jesus, but it's a contrastive typology. They're the same in the, in the sense that both leaders will be struck, die, and the sheep, the citizens, the followers will be scattered but the contrast is that Jesus will be raised back to life, will gather his sheep around him. Ahab, of course, will not be raised back to life, and Israel will remain without a shepherd after his death. I also want to say something about the very close of this discourse, where Jesus says, I've said these things to you that in me you, have, you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Now, the Greek verb there is nik which means to conquer, to overcome, to be victorious. It's only used once here in John's gospel, but in 1 John, it's used five times. And in Revelation, in John's apocalypse, it's used 17 times. And it's this idea of being victorious over the dark forces, over the satanic foes. Jesus says, I will nikao, I will conquer, I will overcome the world. And if you're wondering why I have a Nike swoosh on the image there, that's because this verb nikao 
is related to the name of a Greek goddess, which we would say as Nike. So just like this winged, this goddess is winged, so the, the Nike swoosh came from that. It's the idea of fast transport, of, of swift motion that's derived ultimately from Nike, this, this Greek goddess. So Jesus says that I will be the victorious one. I will be the one who brings about a victory. I'm going to be the one who overcomes the world. This course is an echo of the very opening of John's gospel, where the darkness has not overcome the light. It's a different Greek verb there, but it's the same idea. Over and over, the dark forces oppose Jesus. This is, of course, coming to a head in the gospel of John. He's about to be arrested, and his sheep are going to be scattered when this shepherd is captured and struck. And yet, he will overcome the world, and then he will return to the Father and send the Spirit, and he will continue to teach his disciples, no longer in these parabolic, dark sayings, but clearly, openly. And what will they do? They will preach the gospel. They will spread the gospel. Churches will form, and these churches will ask in the name of Jesus for those things which they, which they need. And they will be heard because, as we learned, to ask in the name of Jesus is to ask in the to based upon the totality of who he is and what he has accomplished for us. This one who is victorious over the world, victorious over the dark forces of evil, victorious then for us. And this victorious one in John's gospel will go on to pray for his believers, for his immediate apostles, and for the church who comes after him. So that's John 16, 23 through 33. We got a little bit of Isaiah in there. We have some of the Torah. We have some other parts from Zechariah, all of which are helping us to better understand what is being communicated here by Jesus to, to us, his church. So I pray that you're all doing well, and I also ask that God's mercy and grace may be yours in abundance in Jesus Christ, our victorious Lord. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. 